Get a Handle on Hands. This is part two of a four-part series that will help you master the muscular tendinous system of the hand, which is fundamental to the evaluation and treatment of hand injuries. I am Bill Hayden, an emergency medicine physician, your author and narrator. In part one, we identified the three muscular tendinous divisions of the hand, the intrinsic division, the extrinsic flexors, and the extrinsic extensors. This presentation focuses on the muscles of the extrinsic flexors. As you will recall, the resources for these presentations are The Hand, published by the American Society for Surgery of the Hand, Examination and Diagnosis, The Hand, also published by the same group, Primary Care of Common Problems, and the SEBA Symposia publication, Surgical Anatomy of the Hand. All of these are available on Amazon.com. As in Part 1, this is an interactive educational activity. For this, you will need a latex glove and your blue and red markers. Pause now to place your glove on your non-dominant hand. Recall the three basic divisions of the muscular tendinous group. First, the intrinsic division. The origins and insertions of the muscles lie within the hand itself. We will do a brief review momentarily. The next division is the extrinsic extensors, whose muscles are located on the dorsal aspect of the forearm. Finally, you have the extrinsic flexors, which we will discuss. These muscles are located on the volar aspect of the forearm. Let's review the muscles of the intrinsic group. Over the hypothenar eminence, you have the flexor digiti minimi, the opponens digiti minimi, and the abductor digiti minimi. Over the thenar eminence, you have the flexor pollicis brevis, the opponens pollicis, and the abductor pollicis brevis. The number eight in the palm of the hand represents the seven interossei muscles along with the adductor pollicis. The seven interossei muscles include the four dorsal interossei, the so-called dab interossei, indicating that the dorsal interossei abduct the fingers, and you have the three palmar interossei, the pad muscles, indicating that the palmar interossei adduct the fingers. The final muscle of this group is the adductor pollicis. This is a pie-shaped muscle that attaches between the thumb's metacarpal and the third metacarpal. When this muscle contracts, it adducts the thumb toward the palm of the hand. The final muscles include the four lumbricals. These are designated by the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. These muscles help flex at the proximal interphalangeal joint while aiding an extension of the distal interphalangeal joint. All the muscles indicated in blue are innervated by the ulnar nerve. Those in red are innervated by the median nerve. Take note that the deep head of the flexor pollicis brevis has ulnar nerve innervation. This is indicated by the blue crossbar. The remaining body is innervated by the median nerve. Now let's discuss the extrinsic flexors. If you flex your wrist and make a fist, you can feel the contraction of these muscles. Pause the video, flex your wrist while making a fist, and palpate these muscles as they contract. You have three extrinsic flexors at the wrist. On the ulnar side of the wrist, you have the flexor carpi ulnaris, or the ulnar flexor of the wrist. On the radial aspect, you have the flexor carpi radialis, which is the radial flexor of the wrist. Finally, in the center, you have the palmaris longus. This tendon may be absent in 30% of the population. It is often used for tendon transplants. 
The red marker indicates median nerve innervation. The blue marker indicates ulnar nerve innervation. Pause the video while you make these markings on your glove. Now let's discuss the finger flexors at the proximal interphalangeal joint. All proximal interphalangeal joint flexors are innervated by the median nerve. Remember that the thumb has only a single interphalangeal joint. The flexor at this joint is the flexor pollicis longus, or the long flexor of the thumb. The finger flexors at the proximal interphalangeal joints is the flexor digitorum superficialis, or the superficial flexor of the fingers. The Latin adjective superficialis, or in English superficial, is used to indicate the position of these tendons as they pass through the carpal tunnel. These tendons are superficial to the deep flexor of the fingers, the flexor digitorum profundus, which we will discuss. Pause the video to mark your glove as indicated. Now let's discuss the finger flexors at the distal interphalangeal joints. Use your red marker for the index fingers, distal interphalangeal joint, flexor digitorum profundus. Use your red and blue markers for the third fingers, distal interphalangeal joint, as this is variable. Some people have flexion at this joint via the median nerve, while others have flexion at this joint via the ulnar nerve. Use your blue marker for the fourth and fifth fingers distal interphalangeal joint. Again, the red marker indicates median nerve innervation, and the blue marker indicates ulnar nerve innervation. Flexor digitorum profundus means the deep flexor of the fingers. The Latin adjective profundus, or in English deep, again refers to the position of these tendons as they pass through the carpal tunnel relative to those tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis. This comprises all the muscles of the extrinsic flexors. Three extrinsic flexors at the wrist, the flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi radialis, and the palmaris longus the flexor pollicis longus of the thumb, the flexor digitorum superficialis at the proximal interphalangeal joints of the fingers, and the flexor digitorum profundus at the distal interphalangeal joints of the fingers. In part three, we will explore the final group, the extrinsic extensors. I wish to give special acknowledgement to the following medical students, Cynthia Chilitko, Chad Fuller, and Amadou Camara. To receive an annotated Latin glossary for the hand, send your email request to jwhadenmd at gmail.com.